Hello everyone and welcome to episode 21 of the Sado Briefing series. Today I'll be talking about the DC-10 uh, VLATs. So uh, a ways back I uh, was able to convert the SGA DC-10s uh, with the external uh, uh, retardant tank for the uh, that represent the aircraft flown by 10 tanker air carrier seen here in front of me in the older library. Um, that model, I mean, it's already a great base model. Um, and then I came out with a version two package that had the updated, uh, new libraries, which I'll insert a picture of here. And, uh, that package included those new base libraries. Um, and that was pretty much it. And then they basically went on, uh, for however long you can fly. I believe it was compatible in both FSX and P3D. However, I decided to dust them off and make a P3D only update, um, that took the external tank and I remodeled it and made it a little bit higher detail. Um, I got rid of the old tank. Uh, and I redid some of the textures. I added PBR to the aircraft, redid all the textures in 4K. I redid a lot of the um, the um, the details and things like that on it. Um, if I can zoom in on the, the tank here, the tank has a little bit more detail than the original did. Um, and I did some, like I said, other small details um, to the aircraft that were missing and uh, corrected some things that I noticed from the original pack. Uh, that was done. So with this package, I'm planning on there being 11 libraries in total for it. So with that, you'll have all of the original, what I call the generation one libraries, which are this one here. And then you'll have all the aircraft and the generation two libraries. So that right there is eight paints. The remaining uh, paints that I'm including in this are the contract libraries that these aircraft flew for for the various countries that they were in contract for. So not only will you have obviously, like I said, the U.S. operating libraries and those eight those eight eight options, but the other ones will be two for Australia. Uh, it's tanker nine twelve and nine fourteen, I believe, or nine ten and nine fourteen, um, or nine twelve. I don't, I don't remember offhand, but it's two of them for Australia, uh, for uh, New South Wales Rural Fire Service. Their contract libraries for 2015 and 2017, I believe. And then Tanker 914 will be a contract library for Chile. So Chile did um, contract them, I, I believe, a few times. Um, in the recent years, um, but uh, there's just minor differences in these Generation 1 libraries with those um, contract markings on them. Um, but at least they represent the countries that they flew in and for for the people that want to uh, fly them in those, uh, those configurations. Um, there's a few other things that I've changed with these. Um, the original uh, pack that I released was the DC-10-10 and a DC-10-30. So the original 10 tanker air carrier DC-10, the first one that came out was tanker 910, and it was a DC-10-10. And it was retired, and their entire remaining fleet were dash 30s, including the new tanker 910 is also a dash 30. So all of the um, weight configurations and things like that needed to be changed in the aircraft CFG along with some other limitations and things like that that come with um, the aircraft. So I've also included with this a, uh, a little spec sheet uh, for people that use Firefighter X. Um, you can input all the information in that for carrying the correct amount of weight and retardant for the aircraft. So. The interesting thing is, is that the DC-10s kind of flew in two different configurations in terms of their capacity. The tanks and everything, the aircraft looked fairly similar to each other between a Dash 30 and a Dash 10. The difference mainly being is the Dash 30s have more powerful engines. So it made for a better um, platform, essentially, for um, 
the VLATs. So uh, that's why 10 tanker air carrier, I believe that's why they're all dash 30s is for that additional performance that you get. So originally when the DC 10s, the first DC 10 came on contract, they had a capacity, a total tank capacity of 12,000 gallons of retard they could carry. But on contract, they had a 400 ish gallon, um, uh, cap that they didn't go over. So they went on contract at 11,600 gallons, which, uh, off the top of my head is something like 104,000 pounds of retardant that this carried. So you're talking a lot considering that a, a regular large air tanker carries in the range of 27,000 to 36,000 pounds. So this is carrying a lot more than that. So, however, I think it was in 2013 or thereabouts. I'm not exactly sure when this happened, but the tanks, the way that the DC tanks are, is that they've got, I believe it's five tanks in total inside the external tank system that they have. But they have a fore and aft fairing tank section that they no longer use. I don't know why that is and why they decided to not use it anymore. Maybe they felt it wasn't necessary or there was something about it that they don't use them anymore. But now um, they fly with 9,400 gallons. So they did cut back their capacity slightly. You're still flying with 84,000 pounds plus of fire retardant aboard, which just, I mean, still is a, a lot. And they can drop a retardant line over a mile long in some cases, depending on the coverage level. So um, with these, I've also made that uh, in the, the documents for setting them up. So you can either configure the jets in their early contract configuration where they were carrying that full 11,600 gallons or the current one where they're carrying 9,400 gallons. So you have that, uh, that the uh, reference material to do that if you say you wanted to and simulate um, either or, or even flying, you know, kind of unrealistically nowadays with that much weight. So, and uh, another interesting fact about the DC-10s is, is that they can actually, if they were if their tanking system was set up that way, they could carry a lot more retardant than that even. So a fully loaded DC-10 in, uh, in passenger configuration weighs, their maximum takeoff weight, I believe, is 572,000 pounds. So that's what they could take off with in a full passenger or cargo configuration, which is a ton of weight. You're talking 747-type weights in some respects, depending on the version of 747. However, the VLATs, they keep them well under their maximum capability for an additional performance and whatnot for they need for um, flying in uh, t the terrain and stuff like that that they do. Um, according to 10 Tanker Air Carrier, the DC-10s operate typically between 310 and 405,000 pounds. So you're still talking well under uh, their maximum capacity uh, for takeoff weights. So, and I believe that makes it so that the the DC tens require a runway that's, I think it's seven thousand feet or so. So that well, that's with a full load, which I mean is still a very long runway, but um, you know it's not really a whole lot more than a large air tanker, which is 5,000 feet. They have a minimum requirement of a 5,000 foot runway. So uh, you're talking a whole lot of aircraft and not much extra runway space. And I think that's kind of why the DC-10s have lived on as long as they have compared to the 747s. And uh, kind of going off tangent a little bit, but the 747s, over the years, there's been several iterations of the 747 Super Tankers. Uh, I believe to this date, there's been three or four different variations of them. And all of them have gone through their own separate phases of changes and issues, but they all kind of revolved around this single tank design that was developed by Evergreen. And at the onset, that tank could carry about 20,000 gallons, which is double what the 740s or the, 7, the DC 10s could carry. But it was a complicated and com, you know, very complex and expensive pressurized tank system, whereas the DC 10s are a gravity fed system. 
traditionally a lot more, lots more simple and a uh, lot lower maintenance cost to maintain a system like that with using just gravity instead of having to pressurize this gigantic 20,000 gallon tank. Um, so the 747s went through a whole heap of red tape. Let's just say, I'll leave it at that. And the companies did what they could to try and operate around a lot of that, but it was just too expensive and too complex. And that's kind of why the 747s never really kind of took off and got um, used like the seven th or the DC-10s did. So in DC-10s, obviously there's four of them in service now, and they've been in service nonstop since 2007. So here it is. We're going on almost a decade uh, or over a decade now of them being in service. And uh, the DC-10 or the uh, 747s are no longer around. So, and maybe we'll never see another 747 as a tanker, but you never know. But um, with these, obviously, they'll be around for quite a while. Who knows? There might be more. Um, but uh, with that being said, um, I'm also working on uh, these, these, and I'm also working on several things, actually. I'm working on... Um, maybe doing some scenery releases. I'm been talking with Jeremy and, uh, we're trying to get his, um, his Hemet Ryan X scenery released. And that will be for both FSX and P3D. I'm still working on some texture, um, things for that scenery. And once I nar narrow down fixing those, it should be good to release. And if you guys have seen any of my videos, um, released over the years, you might have seen uh, flying out of Hemet Ryan, and it's ba and it's that scenery that we're going to be releasing. So, and I am working on some other scenery um, here. I'm sitting at San Bernardino, which is one of the other uh, air attack based sceneries that I'm going to be working on. Uh, and there's a few other air attack bases in California that I will start with doing, and then eventually, hopefully, once I get better at it, we can branch out to do more. But uh, speaking of FSX. I know I was talking about we were going away from FSX, and in some circumstances, it still is, might be possible for me to do some compatibility stuff with FSX. So the DC-10s, like the Firehawks I just released, um, the, the Firehawks are mainly for P3D, but the paints could still work in FSX. So you just needed to do some you know tweaking of your own. The DC-10s, however, I'm going to be looking at possibly removing the PBR and some of the other things that are P3D specific so that this might, might be able to work in FSX. So I'm just getting done with the lava rework. Um, as, I'm, as I'm doing this video, I'm just done with the lava rework. There might be some small tweaks I need to do here or there, but I'm going to try and test converting them for FSX2 and releasing two separate versions. Now, this doesn't mean that I'm going back and doing FSX work too. It just so happens that this project in particular might yield itself to be able to be converted without much effort to FSX use as well. So if you want to keep following on those updates, I'll be letting people know on Discord and on the Facebook page like I usually do. Now, getting back to the other project that I'm working on. So... You might have remembered from the last video, if you watched, that my old machine, my old development machine, kind of uh, decided to stop working. And I had to try and recover what I could from those files. And one of the aircraft that I was able to semi-recover was the S61. So I am going to try and revive that project. I have been slowly piecing it back together and doing what I can with it. And it looks like after flying it uh, in the sim, I got most of it working again, but there are still some bits and pieces that I have to rebuild from scratch if I want to continue um, converting it and making it uh, and improving it. Because uh, the aircraft I'm basing it on is from FS9, I want to say. It might be even older than that, even. So it needs a little bit of uh, coaxing to uh, kind of bring up to the uh, P3D standard. So uh, that helicopter... However, I will not be doing anything for FSX with. Uh, so right now, it just looks like I might be able to do this with a DC-10. The S61 will not be an FSX. So, but like I said, the DC-10 is still kind of up in the air. So 
Um, you can kind of stay tuned with all that stuff there. I mean, it's kind of a lot that I'm doing right now, but we'll kind of see how it all plays out and, uh, try and keep everyone updated. And, uh, thanks for tuning in and, and, uh, watch for the next stuff.